Live from the San Jose McHenry Convention Center, it's The Cube at Open Compute Project U.S. Summit 2015. Hey, welcome back. I'm Jeff Frick here. You're watching theCUBE. We're at Open Compute Project Summit 2015. This is the sixth OCP Summit. We were here last year, about 20, or no, about 3,000 people. It's really had a small, intimate affair, and in fact, Frank said they don't want it to get much bigger. So uh, we're really excited to have our next guest, Thomas Summers, CEO of Rex Computing. We had Thomas on last year. Welcome back. Oh, thanks for having me. So last year we were on, we talked a lot about your, your story, Thiel Fellow. Um, probably the youngest uh, CUBE alumni that we have, so congratulations on that, and we're excited to get you back on and get an update. So what's going on with Rex Computing? What happened since, uh, since we saw you about a year ago? Yeah, so ooh, it, was about, uh, it was January of last year, it was the last summit, so uh, about 14 months, but uh, lots happened. So we've uh, moved away from you know, just focusing on the board level and integrating other chips, and instead into actually uh, uh, building our own uh, process architecture and we're looking at actually being able to tape out those chips and uh, uh, have the world's most power efficient processor. Yeah, so back up a step. So what's your guys' core focus then? You're looking for big, big iron, big computing power. Yeah, so when we started Rex Computing, uh, the goal was we wanted to be, have the most power efficient uh, supercomputers in the world. And we thought at that point, um, it may have been possible to use other people's uh, you know, processors. And uh, you know, as we were developing that and the system that we showed um, last year at OpenCube was you know, getting there, but uh, we, we realized that there are a lot of fundamental issues with how processors are currently uh, designed and built. And um, we were kind of crazy enough to say, well, maybe we could do a bit better. Right. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing. So it's, it's interesting how the power, the power discussion has evolved over time as these data centers have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and power becomes a real big issue. But you would think for a supercomputer that wouldn't necessarily be the case because if it's a dedicated um, unit to do really big problems, is power such a big deal? Why is power a big deal in supercomputing? Yeah, so part of the biggest uh, single user of supercomputing is the United States Department of Energy. Um, <laughs> That's so, the irony. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, uh, like the Department of Energy is tasked with uh, uh, actually maintaining the, our nuclear stockpile. Uh, most people don't realize that's the DOE's job. And uh, the, so they do you know, weapons testing or simulations uh, in addition to making sure that like, these current you know, warheads uh, uh, are able, you know, are still safe. Um, that's one of their big jobs. That's the their nuclear uh, uh, national security agency, the NNSA um, portion of the DOE. But they, they run uh, uh, a number of the national labs, and they have the you know some of the world's most powerful computers. But for the entire Department of Energy, their their power cap by executive order by the president is 20 megawatts, um, and so they you know have these huge tasks which need to be accomplished and they have this 20 megawatt budget so and right now their their biggest computer which is the number two in the world is called titan and that attains about 17 petaflops of sustained uh, computing power and the department of energy's goal is to get that up to uh one exaflop which is a thousand petaflops and they still have this 20 megawatt budget so while they're currently at about three to four gigaflops per watt in terms of energy efficiency, they need to be at 50 to be able to even be think of exascale being at all feasible. So they need over an order of magnitude power improvement to even think that you know, this thing is uh, something they, they can reasonably uh, put together. And there's actually a presidential directive as to the limit of the amount of power that they can consume. Yes, and that's the 20 megawatt Interesting. limit. So talk a little bit about the evolution of supercomputing and high performance computing from what used to be, remember the good old days, the pretty craze with the little bench around the, around the computer on the outside and you know, really dedicated uh, specific devices for that versus using cloud and x86 architecture in massive scale, especially from like AWS or a place where you can, you can basically rent massive capacity. How's that game changing the uses of supercomputing and then what you're really focused on, the power consumption in supercomputing? 
Yeah, so the, when most people think of supercomputers, they think of the Cray 1, the, the system you just uh, described. And so Seymour Cray is thought of as the founder of supercomputing, but the Cray 1 wasn't actually his uh, first system. And what most people consider the first supercomputer and you know, held the record th pretty much throughout the 1960s before he went and founded Cray Research, um, or Cray Computer Company at that time, was uh, uh, called the CDC 6600. And so that was from 1962 and uh, is, in most people's opinions, the first real supercomputer. And that was a single machine, had one processor, and it was just aiming at doing things as fast as possible. When he moved to the Cray 1 and started his own company with that, um, the whole idea was vectorization, where you could take a very large data set, put that into a vector instead of, a, a, instead of uh, taking each you know, math, each number, and uh, doing an operation on them individually. The idea was to put that in a vector, or a big, um, or not sure if you remember math class, but. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the vector part, but keep going. Yeah. Um, we got a really smart audience, to, so they're, they're hanging with you. Yeah, to, to explain the basics of it, just uh, you have an array of uh, all the numbers that you're operating on. Okay. And the thing that a vector processor, and what the Cray-1 did, was take multiple of these vectors and multiply a huge set of these numbers all at one time. And so it was a huge, massive improvement over the scalar processors okay. of the time. And back then, uh, you know, 1975-ish with the Cray-1, uh, we were down to, you know, 15, 10, 15 micron transistors. And we were still in the low, you know, megahertz for most things. And so what most supercomputing companies, including Cray, did was they just, you know, kept cranking up the, the clock speed. And they eventually, you know, when get the transistor smaller, which helped the clock speed problem. And so they kept doing that for a while until they realized we're not really getting the same uh, uh, returns from just making things smaller. So then they started making uh, more built, distributed out systems. So um, you know, that was the Cray 2. You had multiple processors. There are still these vector processors, but uh, thought of you know, actually sharing the computation and putting on different pieces. Then Cray made the Cray 3 and Cray 4, which his idea was, uh, you know, almost, what, what is it, thir uh, almost 20, 25, 30 years ago, uh, we should move to some new uh, not silicon. So his idea was going to gallium arsenide, which was a, a really crazy proposition at the time, and uh, it wasn't successful, and that kind of was when Cray started and the, to diminish. And the Cray run, yeah. And so, at that point then, a, a bit later on, but in the mid-1990s, uh, this whole idea of cluster computing, um, start coming about where you can take a bunch of off-the-shelf processors that are typically reserved for personal computers and put them together and you know distribute that work. And uh, there was a lot of uh, you know IBM and Cray were calling that weak scaling, where your uh, uh, the the whole IBM, what's now known as uh, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, was saying that you know we have our big iron systems over here, we have a big beefy processor, and then there's you know, they were making those systems that were selling for ridiculous amounts of money. And then there were these new systems out there which was focusing on having many processors and do parallelization right. instead of right. vectorization. Um, and it turns out that, uh, you know, in terms of cost per, per flop, cost per doing the actual job, it made a lot more sense to go to that uh, parallelization. And so that's kind of what won out. But the really interesting thing getting into today is the fact that we're sort of going back to the vectorization. Right. Because today's GPUs are vector processors. Like you can think of a... a oh, that's a, right, all the uh, NVIDIA GPUs and all that type of stuff. Exactly, and so um, the only reason that they're successful right now is because NVIDIA was able to take the, uh, the old idea of a vector processor and put in a package that appealed to gamers so that they were able to have a huge volume and thus have the cost down. And now they're bringing back that you know, old technology back to you know, the, the big iron HPC systems and uh, finding some success, but it's my theory that uh, that won't be that that won't last long. Because of the processor, or just because it's not a specifically purpose-built processor, or I mean, where do you, where where do you people put in their money? You still got we just covered the IBM System Z event earlier this year, and they're basically repositioning as an integrated system around the modern workloads of cloud and and, and mobile and social and some of those things, and then you've got the massive rise of the of the you know hordes of x86s in these massive data centers, do the two to coexist? Are they workload specific, which is why one is better than the other? What do, what do you think? Yeah, um, 
I'm, and then where does your piece fit yeah, in? Yeah, yeah where, I, does, where does your piece fit? Yeah, I'm not really in the business side of the computing, so specifically the, the IBM, uh, you know, their work, or not really workstation, it's, um, you know, their mainframes. Right, the mainframes right. are pretty different from like supercomputers. They're really focusing on getting as many IOPS and things out of that while okay. not focusing on raw computation. And so I think IBM is in their kind of own little world over okay. there, which, you know, there's the big banks and there's others that have, you know, been using IBM systems for going on 50 years. Sure. Um, and so there's a small market there, but it's not something I really focus on. Um, but when it comes to the, the real high performance computing where you're focusing on compute, the main reason why I think that both the x86 world and kind of these general purpose, or the, when I say general purpose, not in being able to do any computation, but the sense that what's currently in your laptop and in our phone, a lot of people try to build up like that ARM is a lot different from x86. They're really basically the same. But in my mind, when I'm coming from computer architecture, the way that these x86 processors and ARM processors and any, anything that's really used today, including GPUs, are built for a old paradigm. They're, they're thinking of the constraints that existed when these things were initially designed 30, 40 years ago, and those constraints aren't the same today, and we have different problems, um, which I could talk about as well. Right, well I mean, it, it begs the question, so how do you define a supercomputing problem differently than a high performance computing problem or a mainframe or a, or a sea of, uh, of Amazon servers? Yeah, so I would say that HPC uh, is mostly defined by the fact that you have to do uh, a specific operation very quickly and you have, it, it's, I think of HPC as being actually very similar to embedded in the sense that okay. with an embedded system you have a lot of constraints on power, size, uh, and it's really meant to be doing a specific task. HPC is basically just the room or the warehouse size version of that. Um, but it's actually, from the problem solving, both software and the electrical engineering mechanical side, it's very similar problems faced. Um, and there's similar solutions to it. And so, um, I, uh, the, the difference with the mainframe, like I was saying, is like that's focusing on I.O. On the Amazon, I think that's focused on you know, being able to have many different tasks all and being able to um, spread the, com the compute function to different things kind of dynamically. Right, While the, right. the big iron HPC, the, the things that are developed there kind of flow into the Amazon and the, those very large distributed scale, but that takes time, but I think that we're facing a huge problem in HPC in the, at the top 1% right now, and that's going to start affecting the Amazons more and more, uh, you know, in the two to five year time frame, three to five year time frame, and then be affecting all of computer in the five, five year out. Um, so that's why we're, you know, kind focusing. Of the HPC technology is coming down, is what you're saying. Exactly. So in in my mind, by focusing on the problems of the top one percent of computers right now, we're going to be affecting the design and development of all computers in right, the future. Right. Right. So some of the so if you could describe, you know, some of the kind of the classic uh, use cases for the HPC. You already described the one, the Department of Energy, and making sure the nuclear warheads are all safe and sound, which is very important. Um, and we always hear about kind of. Um, modeling of, of, of uh, the atmosphere and you know, it's big massive models. Where do you see, what, what are some of the entry points you see that computing horsepower coming downstream into some applications where it doesn't exist today? So I think the thing that uh, excites me the most and ties into what I was just saying about how embedded in supercomputing is close together in problem set, I think it's actually going to be getting closer in that having embedded supercomputing where if we have self-driving cars or having them in UAVs, you have, are very, very constrained when it comes to actual power budget and cost, but you still need to have a lot of actual compute power going on there. And while you know, the cloud is developing, we're still pretty um, bound by latency and, and bandwidth. Speed when it comes of light to, is uh, fixed, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, if someone fixes, you know, finds a new, new uh, domain of physics and breaks that, then right. they, 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 they win that. But, um, uh, since I like obeying the laws of physics, uh, I'm going to focus on you know trying to fix it at the right. the compute level. So you really think you'll be able to take you the industry the lessons from the HPC down into small pieces that uh, conceptually run a drone, run a self-driving car. Yeah, and because the the root problems that affect HPC really do affect everything else. And what most people don't realize is. Um, like doing the actual computation isn't the, the power intensive part. That was true 40 years, 30, 40 years ago when these architectures were designed. But 
to give an example, uh, doing a 64-bit double precision floating point operation, which is like the most power intensive like computation itself, takes uh, 60 or 100 picojoules of electricity, which is a very small amount, but when you have a very large system, that, that adds up. But actually moving those 64 bits of data from your DRAM to your, the actual registers of your CPU so that it can actually operate on it, takes 4,200 picojoules. So there's a 42x, it takes 42 times more energy to be able to move the data to your processor than to actually operate on it. It's the age old problem, right? Do you bring the data to the processing or the processing to the data? But you're saying even within the chip, you still got that same, that same basic issue. Yeah, and so the, the requirement, we have to improve that by over a factor of 10 to actually make any of these very, very large scale systems be able to, to function. Right. And uh, the, the problem with current architectures is that they don't accept that fact. All these things were designed where you want to be able to have, uh, where, where it's acceptable to have a lot of data movements when the data movement today is actually what's costing you the most. Right, right, and there's so much more data in a usual application. Exactly. All right, well Thomas, we're getting the, uh, we're getting the time, like I want to give you the last, give us a quick update on the company, kind of where you guys are and what we're going to be talking about if we see you at, uh, at OCP 20. OCP Summit 2016. Yeah, um, so we're developing a new processor architecture, new instruction set, new core design uh, that is based on this concept that um, memory movement is expensive and doing the actual computation is much, much cheaper. And so it's not some crazy non von Neumann or anything like that where we're sticking to the basic computer route. So it's you know relatively simple to program but we're developing a 256 core version of this processor and we're hoping to uh, actually have this chip taped out uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. So it's a potential we'll have uh, something uh, next year, I'm not guaranteeing actual silicon, okay. but uh, shortly afterwards, hopefully. But um, I, I guess the, the other big thing related to open compute is I'm uh, the co-chair for the open compute high performance computing oh, very group, good. Um, which we started up in this past year. And Were you the one that they talked about in the keynote that said, why is there no HPC? Yeah. They said, go ahead and start it. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's been a, I, I won't take all the credit for it, it's been a collaborative effort. But um, yeah, yeah I, I did talk to Frank about that last year. Yeah, good for you. And, um, but the, the part of, so what we're doing with the Open Compute HPC project, uh, my, you know, little bit that I'm focusing on is uh, kind of the open silicon. I, I really believe that, you know, having these closed proprietary x86 and GPUs and things just isn't going to work in this community because what OCP has done so far is open up everything above the processor. Um, and I think that there really is a good case and uh, a lot of reasons why we should be opening up things like the instruction set and you know the, the actual interconnects that go between chips. Because if you can build uh, systems with those things in mind, then you get much, uh, much more efficient overall compute platform. Right, right, interesting. Well, Thomas, again, thanks for stopping by. Thomas Summer, CEO of Rex Computing. Check it out, Thiel Fellow, for sure the youngest uh, CUBE alumni, and I say that with great respect and, and, and admiration for what you're doing. I'm Jeff Frick, we're at the Open Compute Project Summit. It's number six, it's 2015. Be here all day, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Uh, open source meets hardware infrastructure, brought to you originally by Facebook. It's an interesting story, it's only going to get bigger, and we're excited to be here. I'm Jeff Frick, you're watching theCUBE. We'll be back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>